we are doing the median. So it says the median two side AB. So that's this side right here. So we're going to place our sharp point on B, and we're basically going to make a football for AB. That'll find the midpoint. All right. And then when, once we locate the midpoint, all we have to do then is connect the midpoint to the opposite vertex there at C. Okay, so that point right there is the midpoint of AB. The median is the line that cuts from C and intersects the midpoint and cuts the side AB in half. So we just want to place a sharp uh, uh, line coming from vertex C to that point. That line, we can fix it, is the median. Okay, we talked about 26 yesterday. This is the equilateral triangle construction. And then this is the angle bisector. So this, these two angles here would be 30. And that's what CAD would be. All right. Line of reflection is just the perpendicular bisector. So just make a football. Uh, once again, we have the median to side AC. So midpoint and then draw B to the midpoint there. This one is construct the diameter of circle. Uh, remember that the diameter and chord are perpendicular, so just a football here. Um, and then the altitude, once again, so this question, um, Hassan, is, is basically just, we have to use ML. So we're going to draw a line from J to ML first. As long as it cuts it two times, you're good to go. If it doesn't hit it two times, let's say it only hits once, the circle's too big, extend that line out and then we're going to make a football um, for these two intersection points right there and if you don't change your compass length one of the uh, where the arcs intersect is going to cross below the line and then also it should intersect at point J and you can see my compass point is not on the intersection it was on M it's not what we want to do there we go and then we're going to draw a line through where those two circles intersect, which should also pass through point A. And there's the altitude from vertex J to ML. But you have to leave the construction marks. So if we don't, if I don't see these compass arcs here, then it it, it looks like you just drew like a random line. So if I were to, you know, for those and you're left with a line, there's no, how do you prove that that line is creating 90 degrees? So as long as we see the construction marks and I can see, okay, you made that circle and then this circle and that circle are right, the football from the two intersection points, then you're good to go. And like I, I would have a compass in the room and I could, I could place it on it just to double check um, when we're, if, if we're grading there. All right, um, this one is going to construct point D so that it is a parallelogram. This is an interesting one. So um, we can essentially just copy an angle here. And that's really what you want to do. So if we draw a line, we can copy this angle uh, from A. And we would have essentially made a parallelogram going across. So remember to copy an angle. We place our vertex at B. We're going to swing an arc that crosses through the angle twice. So draw circle B, then draw a circle around A. Okay. So good. Then we're going to measure the width of angle B. So it's it's exactly this wide. You can swing a little arc here if you'd like to show that you're measuring the width. 
we're essentially going to place we're kind of kind of switch this up here so if you think about it we really if we switch the spots you see how the sharp point is down on this intersection and then our come our our pencil is going here we would want to do that from that point right here is it that point right there all right then that line is going through okay and then we just have to essentially just copy the segment length from point c so if we place our compass at b point at A, we can just copy the length here. I don't know. Am I doing this? On point C. And where that crosses through, that line coming up right there, that has to be the intersection um, of that, that same distance. And if you really wanted to, you could also place the sharp point on B this way you could draw a little arc here and then copy that same one and you notice that it's going to cross right through the same point there okay and that is where our line's going to go so we're going to draw a line from c through there and there's our parallelogram so we're just copying the angle and then just taking this distance from here to here and copying it out along there. And where it hits that line, okay, that's gonna make our parallelogram. Thirty-three is a perpendicular bisector. So it's a question we're doing um, this question. Forty-five degree angle is going to be made by creating a perpendicular bisector, which is a football, okay? And then we're going to cut it in half. All right. So, do we still want to go through this one, or are we okay with it? It's a good one to do. Uh, I think it's a good one to do anyways because we haven't talked about. Um, yeah, we haven't talked about an, an angle bisector here. So, all right. So where those two meet, line down the middle. All right. This angle we now have here is guaranteed to be 90 degrees. Oh no, not that angle. That guy. Okay, and so all we have to do now is basically cut it in half. So to do an angle bisector, and we'll switch colors here. We'll go to, uh, let's go black. All right. We're gonna draw a circle that crosses through both sides of the angle. So this is our angle right here. All right, we're gonna draw a circle that crosses through both sides of the angle. There's our circle. And then we're gonna make a football for the segment that connects these two points. So just place your sharp point here. And all we have to do is figure out like, okay, where is the middle of the angle? Somewhere right here. So if we take our compass, we just wanna make an arc that cuts through somewhere where the middle of my angle is. So I'm right in here. So I'll make an arc right through the middle. Okay, I'll switch my compass point, start point over to the other intersection of that circle we made in our 90 degree angle, and then I'll draw, okay, another arc, and then where those two arcs cross, that is the middle of my angle. So now I know I'm gonna draw a line starting from the vertex to the 90 degree angle, and then going up from there. And that's 40, 45 degrees. So I would need to see the football the line down, the circle, 
and then the sparks here with the line going out. All right. Okay. Um, dilation of two. Once again, we did that yesterday. You're just going to extend the line out and then just copy that segment length out. We'll talk about the square. So once again, we're going to set our compass length equal to the radius. So sharp point is on some point on the circle. Pencil is going to go on T. And then you're going to make six arcs going around the circle. Oh no, sorry, that's for that's for a hexagon, an equilateral triangle. For a square, we're going to start by just making a diameter first. So just draw yourself a diameter, and then do the football. So start point on one end point, vertex more than half. Make a football. All right. Switch over to the other intersection point. Finish our football off. Okay. And then this line that's going down that we just drew, this red line, is guaranteed to be the other diagonal because we know the diagonals are perpendicular, they're equal, which is what the diameters are, okay? And uh, they create 90 degrees. Did we mention that one? Yep, those two things, the perpendicular bisectors. So now all we have to do is connect and draw a line that cuts through each vertex here or each intersection point of the diameter in the circle. And we are going to have ourselves a square. All right. And there you go. There's our square. Okay. Equilateral triangle and the hexagon are the same type of thing here. So once again, Pick a length from the radius. That is the radius. What length are you going to pick? All right. And then we're going to swing six arcs. Now, you can kind of cheat the system here. If you swing an arc going this way, so it cuts um, through, the, through the circle from here, you can actually draw the diameter. So if you would like. Um, or just move your point over to here and then kind of do the same thing. So once you have your diameter, you really just try to draw two arcs, and then you're good to go. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's draw the diameter first. Let's see if it'll move into place for us. Oh, no. Yeah, pretty close. So go here. Okay. Bring it out that way. So this represents one, two, three of those points. And then we can go on the other side. And remember, our compass length still has to be the length of the radius. And we're going to swing these arcs. Okay. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six. There's my six points. And then I'm just going to connect every single one of those together. The other way we did it in class was once you pick the length of your radius, Then you're going to just pick a point on the circle, and you're going to draw six arcs going around. Okay? Each time, you're just going to transfer that distance around the circle here. All right. Remember, you may be a little bit off on the last one. If there is a point already there and your compass is a little bit off, just change it so it goes through that point. But it should be pretty close. And then you're just going to take your compass from here and then, um, or your straight edge, I should say. 
and then draw the six arcs, the six lines going around the, um, the circle here. And they're about to start hexagon. Okay? You can see that this one's off because the thing moves on me. All right. Any other construction you would like to talk about? If you build a house and when it goes down, you build it wrong. Okay, so a centroid, right, is where the medians meet. So if, uh, they've never asked for it, but we can talk about it. So you remember how we did the median construction on the last one? All right, so the centroid, remember the metroid is where the medians intersect. So what we're essentially gonna do is, we'll just start with a triangle here. All right, so the, remember the medians are the, are the um, find the midpoint, connect across from it. So make a football, I'll do one of them, just so I know that you know what a football is. We should already know how to do that one, right? So swing your compass going out this way, switch it to the other side. All right, draw a line down the middle where the two circles cross. Let's switch colors here so we don't get blended in. All right, we're gonna repeat that construction for this vertex up here. So if we can assume that we've done the construction already and that is the other median right here, okay? So that both of these sides are equal. All right. Then we would know for our question here that this side is congruent to this side, that these two sides are congruent here, these two are getting cut in half. So these two lines are the medians and then this point right here where they're where they're intersecting. All right, that is going to be our centroid. Okay, if we're doing um, ortho centers where the altitudes meet, circumcenter is the perpendicular bisectors. So just, um, you don't have to do the line down the middle. Actually, time out. Hold up. Oh, that's not the medians. So this line right here gets us this point. Can I draw something? Not right now. Maybe a little bit though. Okay. Yeah. This point right here is the midpoint. The median is going to connect. Why is your handwriting weird? From here <laughs> to here. All right. So this this line that we're drawing right here is the median. All right, so after we figure out where the midpoint is for this line, let's get rid of this. Okay, so when we find out where the median is here, or the midpoint is, let's say it's right here, so that these two lines are equal, we're gonna connect that line there. And then where those two lines are crossing, this point right here, that would be our centroid. Now the one part of the centroid, or the one property, is that the top line right here, this part of the centroid is twice as big as the bottom part of the median. So where the centroid is located, this part is two times as big as this part. That's the only property of a centroid. They may ask, and it has not come up uh, in quite some time. All right.
Any other topics you would like to see? I know we're going to do proofs. Talked about that one. Surface area is pretty rare. Um, it could be on there, but it's, you know, we've seen some of the questions that they've asked in the past on surface area. Uh, let me go grab. Can I draw something now? I'm in the middle of helping people, so you're going to have to wait a little while. All right, I think we're going to do this in a little easier way. So hold on a second. All right. This is easier to navigate. All right. Um, so let's see. Out of all the questions they've ever asked on like volume, density, area and surface area, um, there's been three questions on area polygons, surface area and lateral area ever asked out of the 560 questions that they've done. So it is pretty rare. But just to be certain, all right, remember there's essentially just a couple formulas we wanna keep in mind. Turn off the down. Take the plug out. Turn off the down and plug it back in. With the words on or with the mm -hmm. With no words? Well, however, it was opposite last time. It is, if you have a cone, cones are like triangles in a way. So kind of think of the formula for the area, formula like a triangle. So our cone is going to have a kind of round bottom here. Okay, so this, the lateral area is the area of the outside of the cone. So if you cut it open, remember you're going to get this round shape that sort of looks like a triangle, but it's got a round bottom. This height of the cone, right, is called the slant height, and this distance going around this way is the circumference. So our formula for the area, right, the lateral area, or the area around the cone, is like one half base times height, but we're plugging in L for height, 2 pi R for the base, and then a half, so the half and the 2 cancel, and we're left with pi R L. Surface area formula for a cone, which you are not given, is pi R L plus the circular bottom here, which is pi R squared. Okay, we talked about the cylinder in class. So... Cylinder. Put it open. Remember, we're getting two circles. And then the rectangular portion here. So this is the height of the, of the, the around edge. And this piece right here is the circumference again. The area formula for this is 2 pi r h. And then you have to add in the area of the two circles, and they're both pi r squared. So 2 pi r squared, okay, plus 2 pi r h is the surface area. All right. And the only other one, like, that, that's basically besides that, you just need to know the sphere. So... The sphere formula, all right, is just 4 pi r squared. Remember the volume formula is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So for me, I think it's easy to kind of look at the volume formula and just remember you're getting rid of the threes, right? And then the area is squared. So drop off the threes and then it's r squared. Those are the only formulas you really need to know for surface area and lateral area. The other ones you can kind of do in your head as you're working along. So, um, for example, like this question here where we have the gallon paint we talked about in class. 
about he wants to paint the outside surfaces of a cube, right? We know the cube has sides like a square, and it's 12 feet on each edge. And when you look at the cube, right, there's going to be six faces. Each face is the same. So the area of each face is 12 times 12. And then the surface area would be this that times six. That's it. Can I guarantee they're not going to ask a question about it? Of course not, but, you know, we're just going off what they've done in the past. Okay, they've done some circumference questions. This question was about circumference of a circle, kind of a weird one. Um, but essentially, when you look at this part of the circle here, okay, and you dissect this, so a circle of radius of 5 was divided into 24 congruent sectors. The sectors were then rearranged in the diagram below. They want to know the value of x. So if you're looking at what x is here, okay, x is the bottom of these triangles. That's the bottom of these triangles. That's the bottom of these triangles. We put it together. That's just the bottom of the circle here which is just half of the circumference, okay? So it's kind of a cool thing that you could actually actually make where you take a circle that snaps together like a like orange slices almost, and you pull it apart, and you can fit it together to make a, a rectangle. And so this is just demonstrating the area of the circle, okay? Because it's um, the area is length times width. All right, this is the circumference, which is 2 pi r, and this is the radius which is R, all right, and it's half of the circumference, so that's where the formula pi r squared can be seen. But in this case, we just want to take the circumference, which is 2 pi r, and we want to divide it by 2, because it's half of the circle. So 2 pi, and it says r was 5, so we get 10 pi, right, 3.141 times 10 is going to be 31.41 and change. So choice one's our answer. Two thirty. A designer needs to make perfectly circular necklaces. Necklaces each have to have a radius of 10. What's the largest number of necklaces can be made from a thousand centimeters of wire? So just remember, when you make a necklace, you're just making the outside portion of a circle, right? And that is the circumference. So we just need to figure out the circumference of one circle, divided into a thousand, and that gives us the number of necklaces. So C equals 2 pi times 10 again. Okay? So we know this is 31.141. All right, wait, 3.14. Yeah. And change. We'll break out the calculator here in a second. And then just divide that into a thousand. And I believe it comes out to be 15, if memory serves correct. Maybe that'll load for us. All right. Any other questions uh, you guys would like to take a look at topic-wise? We know we want to do proofs, which we'll get there. We just did constructions. We did area. Some circle stuff. I know we mentioned before, Ahmed. We'll take a look at that. Um, I don't know if it's 31.141. I'm gonna, that's why I'm waiting for the calculator to load here. You're just going to multiply 2 pi r. Oh, it's 20 pi. Did we do that? We did that wrong in the last question, didn't we? It's going to be 6 point. 
62 something. Where is the calculator? There it is. It's gone. All right. Don't mind the writing. Calculator. So oh, it's uh, two times pi. Times 10, so that's 62.8312, or 832. All right. Eight three two, and then we're going to take a thousand and divide it by that. And remember, we're actually using the number on the calculator. So, one thousand divided by arrow up to grab that number we just got. Fifteen point nine is our answer here. Now, we can't make 0.9 of a necklace, right? We don't have enough to go around and make an entire necklace if we have 9 tenths uh, to make it around the circle. So that's why the answer was 15 and not 16 here. Does that make more sense there, Hassan, where that number's coming from? That's just bad math on my part. You've got to double it. Okay, so let's take a look at some proofs here. Well, we're actually circles coming up next. So 178 on that one. All right. So in our chords, secants, and tangents, we have the circles drawn. Which statement is not always true? Now, make sure you're paying attention to the always true or not always true. We should have seen this before. Um, also keep in mind that we have um, two types of angles being drawn here, right? We have, if you look where angle C is located, this angle right here, this angle is inscribed, and it's creating this arc ED, if you go all the way down. And angle F is also creating the same arc. So these two angles are equal. Likewise, okay, we have angles here at E and D. These angles are also inscribed, okay, FDC and CEF. They create this arc, so they're both half of that and they're equal. So we know this is always true because they're the same type of angle and they're intersecting the same arc, okay? And because these angles have two sets of angles that are equal, these triangles, we know that triangle CED and FDG are similar is also going to be true. And when we look at the ratio of the sides, right, we have CE, which is this side, over ED, let's go red, over this side, okay, and then we have FD, this side right there, that's terrible. Now that side of course corresponds to CE, all right? And the other one is DG, which is this side, and these two sides are corresponding. So we have like big triangle to small, big to small with two corresponding sides. So this is also true. So that leaves choice number one to be our answer. And essentially the reason is, I can move F and C around my circle. So what happens if I put these lines here, right? When you draw and connect, you're going to change the length, right, of where these two points are. And these, these 
two um, lines are going to change sizes. They don't always have to be the same, depending on where how where I move this point. So if you think about moving F right up here instead, and C, we'll call this C prime over here, all right, you can see like this is way less than that is, okay, even though it's, this line is awful. But you get the idea. So these two lines are going to change depending on where these points go. However, those angles are always going to be the same, all right, no matter what. And that's key. So that's why it's choice number one. But look for those um, pairs of inscribed angles that are going to make those equal. 179, which one of these are not always true again? So once again, can you see things that are going to be equal, right? We noticed before that we talked about these angles that are formed by inscribing a semicircle. These are going to make 90 degrees. Same thing here. Also inscribing semicircle. And we also have a tangent line, right? Tangent line hitting a radius. So that makes this a right angle. All right. And then kind of neat is we have an inscribed angle here. All right. And so this inscribed angle is using this arc right here. So this angle is one half of this arc. And this angle right here, BCD, is formed by a tangent line and a chord. So this angle is also one half of that arc. It's kind of a type of inscribed angle. So which of these is not always true? We're going to try to try to pair up these 90 degree angles and pair up these congruent angles. So C, A, C, B, right? That's this angle right here. Is that the same as B, C, D, which is the angle that's down here, right? And that is not the same, okay? This angle that's blue is the same as this angle, but not that one. So this was not always true. It's only true when this line is, is directly halfway between the angle and it's the angle bisector. But angle B, ACB, right here, and angle ACD. Wait, time out. Angle ABC, which is this 90 degree angle, and ACD is that 90 degree angle. So those are true. BAC, right, 90 equals 90. Okay. BAC, which is here, we just talked about this one, and DCB, those are also equal, okay? Because remember, one half X is equal to one half of X. And then CBA is also 90, and that's going to equal 90 at AEC. So that's why it's going to be choice number one there. And you're always looking for those angles that are making 90 or that are inscribed to the same angle, okay? All right. Key thing here are the types of angles we have formed. We have a central angle here, okay? So remember, this angle is equal to the arc, and we have an inscribed angle here, and this angle is always equal to half of that arc. So which statement must be true? Is angle BAC equal to BOC? No, they're not equal. Is BAC equal to half of BOC? Yes, that's true, okay? And so that's going to be the choice I want to make. Same thing here, right? We know that we, and we did this question like four times already, right? Um, these two sides are equal because they're the radii. So this triangle is isosceles. This angle here is equal to the arc, okay? And this angle right here is equal to half of this arc. But it says that it's equal to, um, the arc is equal to half the angle instead of the other way around. So we talked about that one before. All right, let's get to some questions on finding lengths. 184. So anytime we have the segments that are crossing inside the circle here, remember that we're going to multiply the pieces of those segments together. So it's like part times part. So the two parts of the blue cord are going to equal the two parts of the red cord. So label, 
right? We know that EM is 8. We know that RM is 15. What could the lengths of the two sides be for these ones? We don't know, right? But we do know that if I do 15 times 8, according to the calculator, that has to give me 120. So which of these two products also gives me 120, right? So 12 times 9.5. That is not a calculator. Right, that's too small. We also have 14 and 8.5. And that's 119. That's also too small. We have 16 and 7.5. That does work, okay? And so that's our that's gonna be our pick. So we get 114, 119, 120. All right. So you get the idea here. And so then we know that we would be doing 16 times 7.5 here to make these two things equal. And there's my uh, my answer. All right. Okay. 186 right next door, we have our two triangles. Remember, we have a tangent line meeting a um, radius here. So this is a 90 degree angle and so is this. These two angles are gonna be equal. So we know that these two triangles are similar. So if we're looking for the length of BC, this is really less of a uh, circles question and more of a similar triangles question. Um, if we're looking for this side, we're gonna make a proportion. So we can compare four, which is the side here, and that would correspond to and it's in the same position, so 4 over 10 is going to equal, and we have 5 over x. Cross multiply itself, so 4x is equal to 50, and then divide up by 4 for our final answer, which is going to equal 12.5. All right. If you need that up there, let me know. And then we have, remember, our angles and our, our segments. So we skip down a little bit here. Remember the angles inscribed is half, okay? It's always half, whatever the arc is. So if they tell us this is 268, we're gonna do 360 minus that to get this, and then we take half to get the measure that's there. All right. If we get 190, we have segment lengths. We've talked about the part times part here. So it says if FE is five more than DE, then DE is X. This is X plus five. We know that the legs of um, BC is 12. And it says that it DF bisects chord BC. So each of these is six. So when we do part times part, we're gonna do six times six is equal to x times x plus 5. This is going to be a quadratic. Now, I know it's a quadratic equation, but keep in mind, right, that there's only four choices. So if we plug in to this x squared plus 5x, if we put a, a, a 6 there, right, we can just use the calculator and see which one gives us 36. So if I try 6 squared plus right? 5 times 6. Does it give me 36? Okay, so keep that in mind, like you can kind of just plug in and see which one's going to work. So if 6 doesn't work, it's got to be 4. And you can get the idea here that that 4 is going to work. Okay, so 4 squared plus 4 times 6, which is the other side of the equation, we said four times six. Oh, four times five, right? Undo. There's our 36. So that's how we know that this is going to work. So you can just guess and check. However, we always want to know how to do it um, mathematically. Remember, as soon as we see the x squared, we know we're going to get it equal to zero. So move that 36 over to the other side. And then we're going to look to factor. Factor. 
So we know it's going to multiply to give me negative 36. It's going to add or subtract to give me 5. That's going to be positive 9 and negative 4. And so this is where we're getting a positive 4 as our answer. Because we get x plus 9 times x minus 4. So if x plus 9 is equal to 0, then x is equal to negative 9. And if x minus 4 is equal to 0, then x is going to equal 4. We can't have negative lengths, so there's our answer. Let's on what's up. Yeah, just the equation of the circles. That's it. When you want to convert from uh, center, from standard, from that standard form to center radius form, that's the only time we're going to use it. 189. Another question with circles. Remember that the inside angle is the average. Okay, and and in general, I think if you look it up, I think the circles is like 12, 10 to 12 percent of the whole test. Most of the test is coming from like the proof part with statements and reasons. Um, and like, uh, I gotta think the other one, okay, I'll look it up for us. So we take a look at it. Um, this side over here is DB. So it's just average. The angle is equal to the average of the arcs. Okay. So keep that in mind. So 72 plus X over two is equal to 58, and then we just cross multiply here. So 72 plus x is equal to 116. Take away that 72 to get our answer. And I think we're at 44. Okay. We've done the, this question before. We talked about these parallel chords making grew and arcs on the sides. So CD is 130, just subtract from 180 and divide by 2. <clears throat> All right, we have uh, segment lengths outside the circle. Just remember that if we see a secant line, it's the whole line times the outside piece. And when we see the tangent line, we're going to think tangent squared. Okay? So we're looking for the length of PA. That's X. All right, TB is 3, BC is 15. That means the whole line is 18. So the whole is 18 times the outside piece, which is 3, is then equal to x squared, because it's equal to tangent squared. So this is equal to x squared is equal to 54. We know we're going to take the square root. Remember, if you don't remember how to simplify, just type in your answer. Oh, we lost our... Calculator. Just type a square root of 54 and see what decimal you get. And then you can type your answers and match the same one. But if you break down 54, it's 9 times 6. 6 breaks down to the 3 and 2. 9 breaks down to 3 and 3. So this radical becomes 3 times 3 times 3 times 2. We pull out a pair of 3s, which is 3 outside. And then 3 times 2 is 6 inside. So that is going to be our answer. 193 is the hat rule. So remember when you put a hat on a circle, here's a hat. The both sides of the hat are equal. Okay. Same thing on this one. There's another hat right here. These two sides of the hat are equal. And then going all the way around. Okay. So it says that HO, which is this side down here. All right. Is equal to PE, which means that ZE is equal to OZ because of the hat rule. So if EO is 12, these two sides are 6. Which means this side is 6, and so is this. Okay, and AP is 10, which means this side is 10.
It says that R is the midpoint of TA, so that means this side is also 10 because R is the midpoint cuts in half. And then we can add these together. So 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay, there's a 24 on the bottom here. So 40 plus 24 is going to be our answer, which is 64. All right. Any other questions on circles you guys want to go over? Are we good to move on? You want to go over anything else? And then like we said before, we got to that square root of 54 question. So menu, calculator, square root 54. Here's three squared of six. And then you see they're the same decimals, so that's how we know we're going to pick that answer. Okay. Let's go over some proofs and reasoning. Um, volume is another one that they like to ask a lot of, too. So remember, your formulas are on the formula sheet on the back of the test. So use those to help you out. And we want 513. Okay, which statement is sufficient evidence that the triangles are congruent? Just label as you go here. So A, B, K, D, E, D, C, E, F. There's only two sets of sides. We don't have enough. We need three sides or the included angle. So that's not going to work. Okay. So you can kind of think of this as just S times S, S. That's not enough. Two is angle, angle, angle. Remember that is for similar triangles, not congruence. All right. If we have a sequence of rigid motions, that means that AB is going to map on the DE and they'll be equal. BC is going to map on to EF and they'll be equal. And then AC is going to map onto DF. They'll be equal. And this is going to be side, side, side. The last one, we talked about this before. When it says point A into point D, we really want this to say angle A onto angle D instead, not just two points. Okay, they, they ask questions on the sequence of rigid motions. Just remember, try to get the sides to overlap and then do your reflection. Um, if they're describing on a graph, nice and easy, you can kind of do the same thing. Pay attention to what side lengths are going to map onto what. So remember we talked about in this one that AB here, which is this side, is going to map onto XY. And that BC is going to map onto YZ. So if I do a rotation, right, that'll go onto it. If I did a reflection, it wouldn't. This side would end up over here on top of AC. So that tells me I want to do a rotation. And then my rotation is around the center. So we're only turning two spots. That's 180 degrees. So then we could say something like rotate triangle XYZ. 180 degrees around the origin. And that's enough. Okay? If we don't have a degree measure, we need to make sure we say like until like XY maps onto AB or one of those things. All right. Which one is always congruent when you're mapping? Pay attention to the, or the way the orders, the, the letters are ordered. So J is going to map onto S, right? And keep in mind that we also want to draw out our picture and label. So Joe and Sam, just pick a corner and start labeling Joe in a circle. And then draw another triangle that looks like it. It's supposed to be equal because this is congruent. And then label S where Joe is and then just go around in the same circle. So we started with E equal to M. And EJ equal to MS. Okay. So if J is equal to S, would that lead to the triangles being congruent? And keep in mind, we want it to not always. So if these two sides are equal, if J is equal to S, 
that's angle side angle. So that will always work. Okay? So this is true. Get out of there. O equal to A. That's AAS. So that is true. Okay? So we don't want that either. What about EO, which is this side, right? And AM, which is this side. Now we have SAS. So that's out. And then if we think JO and SA, remember, we don't know this, all right? This is our angle side side or side side angle. That is our donkey theorem. So we don't want to pick that. Okay. Um, for this one, it says write a sequence of rigid motion. So you just want to get this to map onto that. We talked about this before. We may want to get the two angles to be equal to uh, map on first. So we'll translate Q onto M. And then once that's done, this triangle will look like this. And then all we have to do is rotate downward, right, around point M until we get the points like R to map onto L. When I'm done. Okay. Then it says write a uh, set of three congruency statements that would show ASA. So we would want to say something like angle R, right, is congruent to what? Angle Q is congruent to what? And then we would need a side congruent to another side. So if we have R equal to L and M equal to Q, okay, then we have to pick the side in between to do ASA, and we would say QR is congruent to ML. That would be full credit. You don't have to pick these three, but you have to pick an ang two angles and, and the side in between them, okay? All right, remember they're gonna have stuff like um, describe why these are congruent using rigid motions. And you just wanna mention like what if you want to mention what or transformations you're using, so in this question, which we've done before, we talked about if you're doing a reflection and a translation, that you're maintaining distance and angle measure and the triangles we congruent. And you can measure specifically, like mention like SSS if you want, or just that the side lengths are equal is fine. Okay. All right. Same thing here. Like you see that A goes on to X, mark it. C goes on to Z, mark it. AC goes on the X, Y, X, Z, mark it down. Whether or not these are congruent would be true, right? The triangles are congruent because of ASA, and then these two are congruent because of CPCTC. Like that's full credit. Okay, so keep in mind as you're going through what you can mention here. All right, let's do some proofs. How about 525 right here? So we're starting off with, in the diagram, so we have triangle LAC and triangle DNC, LA, is congruent to DN, CA is congruent to CN, and DAC is perpendicular to LCN. That's all given. Remember, you don't get points for setting up the proof with the statements and the reasons and the givens, but you have to make sure you get this in order to get the full credit. You can get points just by getting one statement and reason correct. So make sure you're building through, going through the givens, looking for keywords. Okay, marking things on your diagram. L-A, D-N, C-A, right, C-N. Okay, 
And then we have D A C. Go for it. Perpendicular to L C N. So we're going to get these 90 degree angles. So remember that we can say that angle A C L is equal to angle D C N, which is equal to 90. Perpendicular lines make 90 degree angles, make equal 90 degree angles. This actually gives me enough because in this triangle here, right, I have this side and this congruent with this angle. It looks like it's angle side side, but remember this is actually HL. What we want to say for our purposes is that triangle LAC and triangle DNC are right triangles, and then we can use HL. You just have to describe why there you know they're right triangles because the triangles have a 90 degree angle. That's why they're right triangles. Nice and easy, right? And then they're congruent because of HL. Part B was to just describe his secret to rigid motions. It's literally just a rotation. And even better, because we're rotating and this is a 90 degree angle, we can rotate 90 degrees clockwise about or around point C, and that's enough. Oh, time out. We want to say what we're rotating. So we would this would not be enough. We want to say rotate what triangle? Rotate, and we want to move LAC. Oh, so actually we're moving it wrong. LAC is going to turn this way. So we don't even have to say clockwise. Because we're, when you say 90, it automatically turns left. So we can say rotate triangle LAC 90 degrees about point C. And that would be correct. If you want to write counterclockwise because you're turning left, you can do that as well. Anyone still need it up there? You, you okay? Do you want me to put up a proof and then you guys can um, try that one on your own and then we'll go over it? We'll have a little thumbs up there in the reactions if you want to do that. All right. Good deal. Let's try one of those. Okay. We'll start with an easy one, how about that? All right, let's go with this one, 537, right here. It's an easy one. I'm just going to fill in the T chart right over here. And I'm going to eat up some of this room. Oh no.
Okay. If you need another uh, minute, put a one in the chat. All right, so let's start. We'll start off at the top here. Um, remember, look at your givens. Look for keywords. We should hopefully have seen that word bisect there. So they're bisecting each other. We know that these two segments are going to be equal. And then what else can we add on to this while you guys are waiting there? So TX is equal to XD. Rx is equal to Xs. You want to put congruent, go for it. All right. So segment bisector or bisectors. Cut the segment into two equal parts. All right, from here, we should be looking to get our vertical angles in. So angle TXR is congruent to angle um, VXS. And then we can say the triangles are congruent. All right. And this is going to be SIS. Then we just need one set of alternate inferior angles congruent. So we can say angle T is congruent to angle V. This is with CPCTC. And then we can say the proof statement that TR is parallel to SV because we have uh, lines cut by a transversal are parallel when the two par uh, alternate interior angles are congruent. And if you wrote down two parallel lines cut by a transversal, that's fine, okay? Um, Tape. Careful, it's very sticky. All right, and that would be our first proof right there. Yeah, we'll do another one for sure. Uh, that was probably a four-pointer. Um, how about 542 here? This is probably looking like a six-pointer. I can't remember if this is four or six. We did this one yesterday, so we could just cover the stuff right now.
All right. Do you have an idea of how to do this? Let's ask this question. Yeah, this one was a sixer, six point. Okay, let me know when you guys are ready for me to start going over this. That is part of it, yes. Fahim. There's more to it than that, though. Yep, good, I'm going to get those triangles congruent, use some CPCTC, and I believe you got points for getting the triangles congruent on this one as, as you were going along. Um, all right, let me know when you guys want me to start rolling through it. If you want to work on it on your own for a little bit, we can do that. And there's really two ways to go about doing this. There's kind of a sneaky way to do it. Um, and then there's a way using uh, this shape that's inside here. So we can go over both. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a sneaky way. We'll see if anyone did it this way. And then we'll take a look at the longer version. So the sneaky way is that this started out with being a parallelogram here. So these two sides were parallel. And we knew that these lines were perpendicular. So we're going to have these four angles being 90 degrees. Okay, and keep in mind... If I have any figure, right, with four sides that has four 90 degree angles, it has to be a rectangle. Since these two lines are parallel, this line right here makes a weird looking Z. So these angles are going to be alternate interior, and the, this has to also be 90. And the same thing is going on here. These are alternate interior, okay? And this is going to be 90. And as soon as I get those four 90 degree angles, I can say that that shape has to be a rectangle. That was the sneaky way to get through. The other way, like Ahmed was pointing out here, we're going to have to use these triangles to help us out. And, no, nope, that would have been right. Good, I've seen. Okay. Is 
to use these two triangles, but what parts of the triangles are also parts of this, right? We want to get the, these two sides equal, okay? We want to get these two sides equal. And then we'll have a parallelogram. And then all we have to do is get our 90 degree angle in the parallelogram and we'll have ourselves a, um, a rectangle that way. Okay. So here we go. First thing we're going to do is we're going to name our four 90 degree angles that are equal. So we're going to go to number two. We're going to say angle AFB is equal to angle BFD, which equals 90, and then angle, right, CED. You might as well just keep going on this and write the whole thing equals, 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 equals 90, right? Angle CED, which equals angle BED, and all the four of those angles are 90. We're not done yet, though. When I'm done, you can draw. I'll leave the recording for you. Stop. This right. guy's weird. Perpendicular lines make 90 degree angles. The toys of kids. He doesn't know how to read. You're done. Go away. Done. Yeah, mine. It's all right. I'm sorry, Matt. We're recording now, so I'll post it when we're done. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part, we need to make sure we say that these four, out, the outsides here are equal. So we're going to say for three, AB is equal to DC. We can say congruent. And then BC is congruent to AD. Opposite. sides of a parallelogram are congruent. So now we have this side equal to this side, and we have this huge line right here equal to this big line down there. All right. Now we're going to get these two lines equal here, these two lines, by doing some subtraction. So keep that in mind. We're going to have to subtract this big side from this smaller side right here. So we're working there. We also need angle A to be congruent to angle C. Switching up colors here, right? Opposite angles. of a parallelogram are congruent. And now we have enough to do five the triangles congruent. D E C That's angle, angle, side. Now we can do some CBCDC stuff. So we want to say DE is equal to BF. And also that AF is equal to EC. So that's going to get these two segments right here the same. All right. Then we're going to do some subtraction. So BC, which is this whole side, take away EC, is equal to AD. Take away AF, 
That's a subtraction property of equality because we already know that BC and AD were equal. We just said that AF and EC were equal. All right. Switch out BC minus EC for BE and AD minus AF for DF with either substitution or segment addition. And we now have a parallelogram. We have these two sides equal. We just got those two sides equal. So B, E, D, F. E, D, F is and actually we kind of have enough to just say it's a it's a rectangle right now okay but what we'll do it in two steps we'll say it's a parallelogram first and then we'll say it's a, a rectangle you can do this in one step by combining these together r e c rectangle Sorry about the jumbled mess there. So nine, remember, is in a parallelogram. Opposite sides are congruent. And you can keep going. In a rectangle, opposite sides are congruent. And then you would throw this piece in for the, for the parallelogram, okay, or for the rectangle is that we have a 90 degree angle. So a parallelogram with a 90 degree angle is a rectangle. And if you did the super shortcut way, you would just say a four-sided, a, a, yeah, a quadrilateral with four, 90 degree angles is a rectangle. And there's that six pointer. Okay, so keep in mind, so the six pointers have sometimes been like um, volume questions with some density tossed in. They've been proofs. So a little bit here and there what it could be. Uh, they've also been the coordinate geometry proofs where you have to prove like it's a rhombus and one of those things. There's always a six-pointer on it. Every single exam has one six-pointer. There used to be two, and they changed it to one. Proofs? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you could look through the exams and take a look. Like I said, it's congruent triangle, parallelogram, rectangle rhombus, like we just did here, the coordinate geometry one, okay? Those are the other three, like, different types of proofs that we've kind of been working on. There's a similar triangle proof, right? So there's four. So like it, it kind of varies. And where it shows up on the test is also going to determine how hard it's going to be. If it's part three, where it's a four pointer, it's going to be easier than in part four. If it's a part two, it's going to be a lot easier. Volume six pointer. Yes, I think, um, Let's do this. We'll end, we'll end on this one today. The test that we have, we are going to go over today, which is, I don't mind we didn't. Don't worry about that. Um, had a proof on it and had this crazy question. This is a six-pointer. See how this one, um, um, this had two six-pointers. This is what they used to do. Um, one of them was like a, a real-life example, and one of them was like a, like a proof. Now they only have one, and they moved the six-pointer to like a four-pointer, and they made it a little bit easier. How about we try number 35? And then we'll go over that last one. Uh, oh. 
I meant we've been over this one in class. Let's take a look at the conversion chart, though. I'll show you exactly what we're talking about. Okay, here's January's conversion chart. It's pretty forgiving. Pass. Our goal should be getting like 85s. That's what we're kind of looking for here. And it's kind of an inverse curve. So a 65, okay, is a 31 on this. It's right around the 30 point. About 15 multiple choice questions, 15 to 16. And 85, though, was a 63. So these fours really should be aiming for a four, which is like around an 80 or higher. We'll go 85 for mastery. Okay? So 63 out of 80. All right? 17 points off gets you an 85. All right, so let's try to aim for at least an 80, 85 here. You let me know when you would like me to start walking through number 35. In the meantime, I'll start the T-chart. And we're going to move this up here. A-E-C-F. I'm not done. Still working. Well, after two more questions, then you can drop. Like 15 minutes. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys two more minutes and then I'm going to start going over this.
Okay. So, any ideas on how we're going to go about getting this? Big ticket items here. What are some big things we're looking to do here? All right, good. So we want to use the fact that this big shape is a parallelogram, so let's do that right away. We can do that because of these first two givens. A, B, and C, D are both congruent and parallel. That's enough to say that A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. That's one point, by the way. All right. And then in a parallelogram... One pair of sides is congruent and parallel. Okay. Second thing is we are really having another given, right? Which keyword here, which is perpendicular. So we want to get these angles here equal to 90. And really we want to focus on the fact that if we want to get AE equal to FC equal to SCF. These two sides are parts of what? Triangles. Triangles, that's right. So these two triangles, and we our options are we can either get these two triangles congruent right here. Okay, which is doable, or we're going to get the other two triangles, these two triangles equal, and then subtract away EF from both AF and EC to get left with these two parts. So those are our options here to work through. Okay, because it's a parallelogram, right, we know also that these two sides are going to be equal and parallel. Okay, so keep that in mind. And we also have the 90 degree angle, so we got to make those statements. So for three, we're going to say that angle AED is equal to angle BFC, which is equal to 90. And then perpendicular lines create equal 90 degree angles. Then we can say that these two sides are equal and parallel. And these two triangles already have an angle equal right here and right here. And then we have a Z running between them along those parallel lines. So we can get those angles equal and we'll have angle, angle, side. And then we can do CPCTC. Okay. So we're going to say that AD is congruent. To BC and then AD is parallel to BC and we're going to use that same thing we wrote up here in a parallelogram one pair of sides is congruent and parallel Say angle D A E is congruent to angle B C F. Uh, two parallel lines cut by a transversal. All right. Alternate interior angles are congruent. Alternate interior angles are equal. All right. Then we have the triangles equal.
And then we can finish off with AE equal to CF. So angle, angle, side. And we're good. Instead of doing statement four, right, we could have gotten these two triangles equal with the interior angles. All right. Okay, use these right angles. And then we could have done this line equal to this line and then subtract away side EF from both and gotten those as well. So that was another option. But that is our proof. All right. And then Hassan, this question is a beast. So be aware. They wouldn't normally ask a question. The six pointer, the four pointer showed up. A lot of times it's like a density question. So this is a pretty good one. That there's two types of poles that it gets a little tricky. So new street lights will be installed around the section of the highway. The posts will be 7.5 meters tall, made of aluminum, and the city can either do cylindrical posts um, or rectangular prisms. So if we do a cylindrical post, what we need to realize is that there's a hollow on the inside. All right, it's 2.5 centimeters thick, and the outer diameter is 53.4 centimeters. So this line going from here to here, the radius is half of 53.4. which is 26.7. Yeah, you're not the only one that's having some slow internet over here. 26.7. Okay. And keep in mind that the outer core, so it's kind of like, it's actually really kind of thin pole. So maybe it's a little more like this. And even worse, we got meters, we got centimeters, oh, we got grams, we got kilograms, we got so many conversions to do here. The worst, right? Um, so key thing we're going to look at here is the depth. Density is in centimeters and grams. And this is talking about kilograms. So we're going to have to do a conversion probably into kilograms here or converting this in the grams here. Your call. And since this is in meters and this is in centimeters cubed, I know I'm going to want to convert this into centimeters. Okay? They would not normally ask a question this detailed anymore. So just Yes, Fahim. Trauma. You guys want to continue down the road with this, or you want me to find a little newer version of a question like this? Or maybe we'll do one poll. How about that? Instead of both. So, converting remember from meters to centimeters we're going to multiply times 100 okay so 7.5 meters is 7500 centimeters okay because times 100 so two spots to the right oh two, two spots 750 centimeters that's times a thousand okay now
what that means, right, is that it's the aluminum is 2.5 centimeters thick. So this is the other part of this question that's kind of interesting. This radius we know, remember, is 26.7. Okay, the inner radius is 2.5 centimeters less than that. So you have to actually figure out, like, um, and I think my battery's about to die too. This question is draining. Look at that. Be right back. I gotta plug in. Okay, made it. So if this is 26.7, when we make a line to the inner radius, this inner one right here, it's 26.7 minus 2.5. So it's 24.2. So when you're calculating the volume of this to get the density, you have to do the volume of the, of the outside piece and then the volume of the hole, right? And then subtract them and then go on to do the density and the weight and the money. So let's pretend for our purposes that this is a solid post. How about that? We won't worry about this part. Now, converting grams to centimeters or grams to kilograms or kilograms to grams. So when we go from a bigger unit to a smaller unit, okay, we're gonna multiply times that thousand. We're gonna get more of those. When we go from a smaller unit to a bigger unit, we're going to divide because we're going to get less of the that amount. So if we want to take 2.7 grams and turn it into kilograms, okay, we're going to divide by 1,000. And so it's going to move three spots to the right. So this is going to be 0 0.0027 kilograms per centimeter cubed. So if this was a solid post, the volume would be pi times 26.7 squared times 750, because we converted to centimeters and everything is now in centimeters now. Okay. I'm gonna grab the calculator. We're gonna do pi times 26.7 squared times 750. So that's that figure right there. That's the volume. Then we're going to multiply that, okay, times this 0 0.0027 and then times 38 cents. So 167, 167. 9707 point 49 we'll say 49011 okay so the density is equal to the volume times 0 0.0027 all right oh i guess it's it's not the density i guess it's the weight right get back here So we're going to take that number, multiply it by 0 0.0027, and then we're going to take our money, and we're going to multiply the weight times 38 cents. So it's equal to $1,723.38. Now, what we didn't do on this question, which we should have done, if you remember, 
Whereas we didn't subtract away one, seven, two, three point three eight. Is we didn't subtract away the inner core, okay? And then we also would have to figure out if we did a rectangular prism like post, we'd have to do this as well. So like this question's crazy. And then pick one, right? How much money would you save if you subtract? So this question was in, insane. They would not ask another question as, as bad as this. All right. This is probably the worst one I've seen. But let's go back to our sheet here. All right. That we were looking at. Let's go to a volume question. We'll take a look at one that they have asked. But I just want to get you guys the idea, right? Calculate the volume, multiply times the, the, the density, multiply times the money. Uh, money, Hassan, if it doesn't say it's to the nearest cent, otherwise it'll tell you like to the nearest dollar or something in there. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. 292. Here's the density. Okay. So we don't want a multiple choice question. Remember, population density is population over area. So you just divide these two numbers and see which one's the biggest. That has not come up a lot. This question was a six-pointer. Water tower in the picture is modeled by a two-dimensional figure beside it. Tower is composed of a hemisphere, a cylinder, and a cone. You guys did this on a test this year, by the way. This question was also, I believe, a six-pointer with the candles. I have a math test coming up. You're actually going to crush it. Next week. I know all the answers to it. Remember the bag, the street like, the bricks. These are the questions that we've done before. Trees, bakery, with spheres. Do we have a favorite we'd like to pick here from our list of questions? I like spheres. Nice. They're circles. Mm -hmm. Daddy, do circles have infinity sides or zero? We talked about this. Tell me. Could be either or. Don't they have sides on them? The tower one. Where's the tower? Sure, let's do the tower. Mm. All right, we'll do the one right next to it here. You ready? Give me a second. I'm just going to cut and paste it over. I love that they cited Wikipedia, by the way, in their picture. No, almost done. Okay, water tower picture below is modeled. Now remember, this is three-dimensional, but they're showing you a two-dimensional figure, so just keep, keep that in mind, all right? It's composed of a hemisphere, a cylinder, and a cone. The center of the hemisphere is D. It's also the base of the cone. And they give me the pieces of eight and a half feet, 25 feet, 47 degrees. To the nearest cubic foot, what is the volume of the tower? And it holds 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Can the tower be filled to 85% of its volume and not exceed the weight limit to justify your answer? So keep in mind that we're reading cubic feet, pound per cubic foot, right? We see feet, feet. We don't need to do any conversions here, which is nice, okay? And we have pounds and pounds, so we're good to go. All right, so what we need to do is calculate the volume of the different parts. We have the volume of the hemisphere, Okay, which is one half the volume of a sphere, and that's four thirds pi r cubed. We also have the volume of the inside part, which is the cylinder, right? We'll call it CYL, which is pi r squared h. 
We're going to add that together. And then we have to add the volume of the top tone part here. We'll put BC here, CO, all right, which is one third pi r squared h. And remember, these all these formulas, except for the one half part, are all on your formula sheet at the end of the test. Okay, so let's plug in. Now, it's a little bit of work here because we can do the first part. Because remember that this line is the same as this line, because this is the radius. So volume of the hemisphere is one half, four thirds pi times 8.5 cubed. Cylinder we can also do, because the radius is the same as the radius of the, uh, the sphere here, the hemisphere. So the cylinder part, okay, is gonna be um, pi times 8.5 squared. And then the height here going up and down here is 25. Now, the part we're gonna have a little bit of trouble with here is we know that the radius of the hemisphere, right, is also the radius of the cylinder, which is also the radius of the cone, but we don't know is the height of the cone. Okay, but, but we can get it because we're looking at a right triangle. We have one of the sides, which is eight and a half, and we have an angle, so we are gonna bust out some Sokotoa here. All right. So if we have the angle, we have our sides, which is the adjacent, which is eight and a half, and the opposite is the height. So we're gonna pick our tangent here. So tangent of the angle, which is 47, is equal to the opposite, which is H, over the eight and a half, which is the um, adjacent. Cross multiply, so 8.5 times the tangent of 47 is equal to H. So 8.5 trig, tangent 47, gives us 9.115, we'll write that down. But we're gonna use the number in the calculator here whenever we do any calculations. So now we can plug in one third pi times 8.5, that's the radius, squared, times our 9.115 that we wrote down, but really we're gonna use that, that amount. Okay, so the volume of the hemisphere, let's go do it. So it's one half times four thirds times pi, so we can, don't have the parentheses, pi, and then times 8.5 raised to the third. Hit enter. So we're going to go out to about three decimal places, but remember when we add, we're going to add with the whole thing. This is one, two, eight, six point, and I'm gonna write down three numbers here. We'll round it, 0 0.220. But remember, we're gonna use the whole number in the calculator. Plus, then we're doing the next part. 221, pl 220 plus okay. nothing. So pi times 8.5 squared, times 25 is the next calculation. That's 5,674. Take it three decimal places, that's 0 0.502. And then we have the last one here. So one third pi 8.5 squared. And then we're gonna multiply times that number we got, which is that 8.5 tangent 47 there. So this is 689.651. So the total volume is the sum of all three. 
And then we're going to round to the nearest cubic foot. So let's go grab them. So the first one we had was 1,286 and change. The second one was the 5,674 and change. And the last one was the 689, giving us a total of 7,650 to the nearest cubic foot. Okay. Now, we're going to fill the water tower up 85% of its capacity. So we're going to have to take this volume and multiply it times 0.85. So 7650, we're going to use the rounded number now since our last answer was already rounded, times 0.85 is 6502.5. So as soon as they as soon as we take an answer and we round it and we record it, we can use that answer then from there on. Okay? So now we're dealing with this number, right there. All right, and we want to know if we filled up 85% of the capacity, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, the weight, okay, is 6,502.5 cubic feet times 62.4 pounds per cubic foot is going to give us our weight so times 62.4 and we get 405,756 and this is in pounds okay this is in cubic feet and now remember can the water be filled and not exceed the weight limit. Justify just means show work. Explain means use words. So we would say no. The tower can't be filled. As long as you said no, you're good, really. No, right? Because it doesn't say explain. To 85% capacity. <laughs> okay. The weight is over four hundred thousand pounds. And there is our final answer. All right, that is probably going to wrap it up for me tonight. So, just a quick reminder. Let's find the cursor here. I'll send out the link again to eMath Instruction. YouTube channel. On Monday night. 6 to 9 p.m. There's a review. Okay. Also keep in mind here, guys, you could get, remember, this is six points, right? This water tower question, okay? If you were to calculate the volume of the hemisphere correctly, the cylinder correctly, all right? And let's say we found the length of the height using fig and got the volume. That was worth four points. If you then took 85% of the weight and got 405 and said no, that was worth the other two. So I think you guys can handle doing some of the volume question. You should have been able to get probably three points pretty easy on this question, just by plugging into the formulas. Most of the errors in this question happened when they did when you did this. Right, the trig, if you didn't do this and you used um, 8.5 here, that would have been a problem. 
Okay. Um, yes, this is my last review video. Um, I will send you, and if you want, all the exams for, I think, January 2018. If you just go on YouTube, there's a New York State math um, video of all those, all the videos done with all the answers. So you just Google the exam, either August, June, or January, and anything before 2018, there's a video for it from the same website. So just type in New York State Geometry Answers, and then the date, the month, the date, type it into uh, YouTube or Google, you can find the video pretty easily. All right, you guys have worked very hard. You've been studying. All you can control is the effort going in. Everything else will take care of itself. You as well, son. And hopefully we'll have those graded. You take them on Tuesday, by the end of the day, Wednesday, should be the goal. As soon as I have grades, I'll put them in for the campus for you. Thank you for your hard work this year, making geometry kind of fun. You still got three more days. No problem. Have a great one. All right, I'm going to head out.